for those of you who are unfamiliar, we are the Broadway Green Alliance, happy to host this here today. Our mission is to educate, motivate, and inspire the entire theater community and its patrons to adopt environmentally friendlier practices. And as we say every week, that's exactly what we are doing here today all together. And today we have the wonderful privilege of having Tim Guinea here with us to lead us in our quarantine session. Um, yes, applause, thank you. <laughs> um, so Tim is a climate leader in the Climate Reality Project uh, and trainer. And in addition to being an actor in over 200 film and TV projects and the same number of theater projects. And so he is in the unique position to speak from the perspective of both theater and environment, perfectly fitting where we intersect. And so I will speak no longer because I want to turn us over to Tim. Tim, thank you so much for being here today. And I know we're all excited to hear from you. Thank you, Molly. And uh, I want to thank the Broadway Green Alliance um, for having me and for doing this. It's, it's amazing. Um, normally when I do these talks, they last about an hour and a half and I'm doing this one in 45 minutes. So thank I'm, Tim. I'm, <laughs> so I've got to rush like crazy because we want to get, of course, to the most important part, which is a conversation um, with everybody. So um, I did forget to say, uh, to, to give that caveat of if as people have questions, just like if you were here last week, if you would put them in the chat as we go, um, so we can let Tim get through his fabulous presentation and we will address all questions at the end in the last 15 minutes. So, just where, there we go. Um, just quick little background about me. When I was a kid, my parents took me camping um, in a place called Quetico Provincial Park. Um, where the water was so clear and pristine, we, we drank the water straight out of the lakes and rivers without boiling it or putting anything in it. My parents weren't sort of hippie people at all. <laughs> they were very middle-class sort of conservative people, but that's how pristine that uh, wilderness was. And I fell in love with nature, really thought about being a forest ranger. Um, when I was 13 years old, I got a letter from Jacques Cousteau. If you're young and you don't know who Jacques Cousteau is, he was very famous oceanographer who invented the scuba tank, but had a big television series on um, uh, called the, the, the Undersea World of Jacques Cousteau. And he wrote me a letter uh, in 1976 describing uh, what the scientists were saying about climate change at that time, describing the dissolution of the glaciers, the melting of the polar caps, all of those things that we're seeing come uh, to pass. And it terrified me. And as I said, I, I wanted to be uh, involved somehow um, as a forest ranger or something. But then I discovered acting, or what I thought was acting. This, this is a picture from a, a production of South Pacific that makes no sense at all. There's nothing about South Pacific that I can think of that this works for. Anyhow, that's what I did. Uh, and I wound up going into acting, but I've always stayed very involved in uh, the environmental movement. And, um, and oddly, there's also a lot of places where the theater, um, you know, plays like As You Like It, Oedipus at Colonus, uh, uh, The Night Throw Spent in Jail. There, there is a lot of veneration of nature in a lot of plays. So, as was mentioned, I joined a thing called the Climate Reality Project. It was started by former Vice President Al Gore in 19, uh, 2005. Um, I think he realized he didn't have the bandwidth to give the number of speeches he needed to give to make the change he wanted to make. There are about 21,000 of us trained around the world now. And I go all over the place talking to folks about climate change. I've done it in all over the United States and Canada and North Africa. Um, my manager asked me to do a talk uh, at her apartment uh, for a bunch of actors and directors. And Jane Alexander came up to me at the end and said, you have to start an organization for the acting community. Uh, we have a bigger soapbox than we should have. And uh, so I thought about it. I started this thing called the Climate Actors. This is my um, board of advisors. I guess I need a lot of advice. Um, I'm gonna talk, and much of the talk's gonna be really aimed at actors, but it's really aimed at all storytellers. So you'll excuse me if I slide in that direction, but this is meant uh, for everybody. 
So Greta Thunberg at the Golden Camera Television and Film Awards uh, said, avoiding catastrophe is to do the seemingly impossible, and that is what we must do. But here's the truth. We can't do it without you in the audience here tonight. You influence billions of people. We need you. And that's right. That's why actors often get a bigger kind of soapbox. But a lot of times when they use it, people say, oh, he's a Hollywood lefty. Uh, you know, there, there's all of that stuff that comes at us. So we've seen uh, a lot of actors uh, recently really standing up uh, for the climate uh, issue. But again, they get assaulted with that. You guys are a bunch of lefties. And da, 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 da. So we're going to talk really quickly about some things like what are the facts around the climate crisis that artists need to know? Must we, can, must we change? Can we change? And will we change? Because we have to have those facts. We have to be unassailable in our facts, or, or we're in a lot of trouble. Also, what's being done in the artistic communities to address the crisis? And what special gifts can actors, but I say storytellers, bring to this discussion to create the solutions we need? I want to mention hope really quickly. I'm going to bombard you with some bad news to start out. But uh, there's hope coming. I have enormous hope. I deal in this material every day. I'm in no way depressed. I move forward and I'll tell you a secret about why that is uh, a little later, but have hope. Hope is a revolutionary act. Hold on to some for a few minutes. So uh, here's where we start. Here's our home. We're, we're on the other side. Uh, and how great that uh, we have this conversation here in New York. I know some of you guys aren't from New York. I keep forgetting when I'm trying to do these things on Zoom that Everyone's not local, but New York has been the ho home for much of the environmental movement. John Burroughs uh, was here. Pete Seeger went up and down the Hudson River using uh, his art uh, to move discourse on uh, societal issues, including the environment forward. This photograph is the most reproduced photograph in the history of man. It was the first uh, image of the entire illuminated planet taken from deep space. And some months after it was released, the very first Earth Day happened. This, what are we, we're a week out from the 50th anniversary of Earth Day today. Uh, no, yesterday. Anyhow, this is the most important photograph I'm going to show you. This is from NASA. That thin, thin blue line is the Earth's atmosphere. You know, when you walk outside and you look up at the sky, it looks like it goes on and on and on forever and ever and ever. That's an optical illusion. The truth of the matter is, if you had a car that could drive straight up into the sky, in about five and a half, six minutes, you'd break through into outer space. Carl Sagan said, if you paint, if you had a big, big globe and you painted it with a thin, thin coat of shellac, that thin coat of shellac would fairly well represent the Earth's atmosphere. It's this incredible, fragile mechanism that has uh, created the possibility of life. It's miraculous and wondrous. Everything you've ever smelled or tasted, anyone you've ever loved, that has happened because of this thin shell of an atmosphere. I want everybody to take a deep breath. So the air in your lungs contains 400,000 of the same argon atoms that Paul Robeson breathed, that Duza breathed. And I'm gonna get a little woo wooey for the actors. If you're gonna say, if you're playing Julius Caesar and you're gonna say et tu brute and you breathe in, the breath of air in your lungs contains 400,000 of the same argon atoms that Julius Caesar, Caesar breathed during his lifetime. So if you're gonna sing, there's no business like show business, you've got some of Ethel Merman's air in your lungs. I just think that's cool. Sorry for the slight diversion. So. You guys probably all know how climate change works. Solar radiation in the form of light waves passes through the Earth's atmosphere, and most of it gets absorbed by the Earth, particularly the dark places like the, the oceans, and absorbs uh, that. Uh, some of that energy is radiated back into space in the form of infrared waves, and some of those waves hit the atmosphere and are returned back to Earth, where they warm it, and they create the perfect, extraordinary conditions that mankind has enjoyed throughout the Holocene. So we are now uh, dumping 152 million tons of global warming pollutants, which are carbon dioxide, uh, nitrous oxide, methane, into that thin shell of an atmosphere every 24 hours. And what happens is, as more and more of those global warming pollutants uh, collect in the atmosphere, less and less of those infrared waves make it out. So we're holding 
a bigger and bigger and bigger concentration of energy uh, within the atmosphere. Now, there are all kinds of uh, sources for greenhouse gases, the burning of forests, uh, factory farming, the melting of the permafrost, but absolutely incontrovertibly, the number one so source of global warming pollution is the burning of fossil fuels. Uh, here represented in billion metric tons of carbon. If you look at the graph, this is called the Keeling curve, by the way, right around 1950, you'll see it just go flying up through the roof. So CO2 is being released faster now into the atmosphere than at any time in the last 66 million years. 97% of peer-reviewed climatologists who uh, are the people who know the most about climate, that's why they just put ologists after it, 97% uh, of them are in agreement that man-made global warming is real. There's a whole other study that says 99%. I'm trying to actually be conservative around that. In fact, the current administration, which you may know is not a, a big friend to finding solutions on the climate crisis, has said that human activities are the dominant cause for the global temperature rise, and there are no credible natural explanations. This is on us. This is something we have done. So this is a chart looking at summer temperatures. 1951 through 1980, the blue are cooler than average, the white are average, the red are warmer than average. And I'm gonna put a baseline there so we can watch this change. So that's 1951 through 1980. Here's 1983 through 1993, 1994 through 2004. If you look, by the way, on the far right, you'll see a very, very dark section. Those are statistically extremely warm days. And here's 2005 through 2015. And if you look, there's actually more extremely warm days than there, still, than there are uh, average days or cold days. We still have cold weather. The point of climate is uh, that uh, averages are going up and up and up incontrovertibly. 2019 was the 43rd consecutive year with a global temperature above the 20th century average. 19 of the 20 hottest years on record have all occurred since 2001, and the five hottest years have all been the last five years. New York, sorry, keep thinking we were doing this in New York. New York is actually experiencing some of the impacts of climate change more profoundly than the rest of the United States. U.S. average annual temperatures are up about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. We're up almost two degrees. The winters in New York are about five degrees warmer than they are uh, for the rest of the country. Uh, I'm sorry, are about five degrees warmer than they should be here in New York. Uh, this year, in, uh, the daffodils in the parks uh, bloomed about three weeks early, earlier than the previous earliest bloom record. Uh, New Yorkers may remember a couple of years ago, terrible heat wave we had in the summer. Um, one of the things I do is give talks like this in maximum security prisons. And in maximum security prisons, you don't have to convince anybody that climate change is happening. They don't have air conditioning and stuff, so they get it. At least 90 people died in Quebec during that heat wave. This is Pakistan in 2015. Over 1,200 people died. It totally overwhelmed the morgue's capacity to deal with it. And what Pakistan then began doing, and has done every year since then, is they dig preparatory mass graves because they know that these heat waves are coming. And year upon year, they have seen mortality uh, in, in these heat waves. At least 892 heat-related deaths last year in England as a result of heat waves. Kuwait City experienced temperatures up to 124 degrees Fahrenheit. It was so hot, birds were dying and dropping out of the sky. In Saudi Arabia, it got up to 131 degrees last summer. The heat index, and the heat index uh, is not the temperature. It's the temperature and the humidity combined. It's that what does it feel like number. Uh, but it got up to 165 degrees Fahrenheit in Bandar Mashar. I've talked to doctors who've said you don't have, you know, you have three or four hours in that kind of those conditions. It makes uh, human life challenging. It makes uh, animal life and plant life challenging. So 93% of all of the extra heat energy trapped by global warming pollution goes into the oceans. Last year was the hottest year on record for global ocean temperatures. Uh, James Hansen, formerly of the Goddard Institute, uh, has put a study out uh, that CNN picked up on recently that the world's oceans are now heating at the same rate as if five 
Hiroshima-class atomic bombs were being dropped into them every second. We know warmer oceans intensify cyclonic events like hurricanes and typhoons. This is uh, Hurricane Florence hitting, um, hitting uh, North Carolina. We, we have a little bit of a problem in that we tend to not pay much attention to this as it's happening all around the world. So for example, this week, Cyclone Herald, category five cyclone smashed into a bunch of Pacific islands. One of them, Vanatu, this is the second uh, category five hurricane they've had this year. Uh, hundreds of people are homeless. And it's important to recognize that. It's important to realize the scale of this thing. And, and sometimes we don't realize it because our news doesn't mention what's happening. Um, you may remember New Yorkers, Hurricane Sandy that went over waters nine degrees warmer than normal before slamming into New York and New Jersey. According to scientists, the risk of Hurricane Sandy intensity events in New York in 1880 was a one in 500 year event. In 2017, a one in 25 year event. And by 2030 to 2045, it'll be a one in five year event. So warmer air can also hold a lot more water vapor. For every one degree Celsius of warming, uh, the atmosphere can hold up to 7% more water vapor. Right now, there's about 5% more water vapor over the world's oceans than there was just 30 years ago. And if uh, you had heard me talk maybe two years ago, you would have heard me say 4%. I mentioned that to say this is ramping up uh, quickly. Now, that water vapor doesn't just stay over the oceans. It can move great distances. And so we see bigger and bigger downpours. This was a, a meteorological event um, called a microburst. It's also known in the vernacular as a rain bomb or a hail bomb, a snow bomb, a precipitation bomb. It looks fake to me. It looks like bad. I was in a couple of those Marvel comic book movies and it, it looks like bad CGI in one of those movies to me. Anyway, here's a, here's a movie of one in Tucson, Arizona. It looks like God is just dumping a bucket of water on the city. You may remember Guadalajara last summer got five feet of hail in one night. This is Cordoba, Argentina. They got 4.9 feet of hail in 15 minutes. And of course, this, these big precipitation events are happening all around the world. But again, we don't tend to notice. Five days ago, 10,000 people were displaced in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Three days ago, there was flooding in Yemen. 27 people died so far. There are people who it doesn't matter what evidence you present them with, uh, they're going to ignore it. This is a, a pub, I love this picture, in England, <clears throat> and a, a woman is cleaning the window while the flood is going on outside. It's business as usual. We remember uh, in the Midwest last year, the terrible flooding affecting the agricultural sector, which of course is also affected here in New York. We've seen a 71% increase in extreme precipitation events since 1958. Our friends in Chicago have seen about a 37% increase there. So global warming is contributing to an increased incidence of extreme weather because the environment in which all storms form has changed from human activities. You know, when, when we grow up, we're used to the weather behaving certain ways. It behaved those ways because of the foundation of the physics undergirding the weather. We are changing those foundations. Any expectation that we will continue having the same weather is uh, childish. We just can't think that way. Also, the thing that people mention sometimes, well, this is the new normal. It isn't the new normal. We're not at the normal yet. It's getting worse. This is um, a dangerous and moving target, and we have to recognize that. So the same extra heat that pulls moisture out of the world's oceans, uh, causing those big floods we were just talking about, also sucks moisture uh, out of the land, causing longer and bigger droughts. Climate change affects different places differently. So we're seeing the worst drought in Oaxaca in 50 years, the worst drought in Thailand in 60 years, worst drought in Vietnam in 90 years, worst drought in Chennai in India in 140 years. The California drought uh, from 2012 through 2017, according to the BLM, was the worst drought that they had in 600 years. Should mention, uh, the northern part of California is now uh, suffering uh, drought conditions. 
This, of course, leads to more and more wildfires. The wildfire season in the United States West, in the U.S. West, is 107, 105 days longer than it was just in the 1970s. <clears throat> this is the Saddle Ridge fire uh, last year. Uh, I was shooting Homeland. We were about a half a mile from uh, this fire line, and um, uh, everyone except the actors got to wear masks, and, and we didn't. But again, there are people who it doesn't matter what evidence you provide them with. They will continue to deny this. That's, this is not a photoshopped image. This is real. I love this picture. I, I'm a, uh, I, I've never liked golf. So uh, this, this picture works for me in many directions. But we've seen terrible fires. We saw horrible fires this year in Russia, in Africa, in the Amazon, of course, in Australia, where they lost 12.35 million acres. Uh, over a billion animals died. You may not know that was also followed up by incredible storms. They had terrible hailstorms in, in uh, Melbourne. There was a research facility with a multi-million dollar glass roof that was destroyed by this hail. The terrible flooding up in Queensland. This is a kind of hard picture to see, but if you look on the bottom left, right by those palm fronds, there's something dark in the water. This, by the way, is a street. Uh, that's a shark swimming up and down the street. And of course, because of the drought, all of this was then followed by incredible dust storms. That's uh, Sydney. It's really been like uh, the Book of Revelations in Australia over the past year. So for every one degree Celsius of warming, lightning strikes also increase by 10 to 12% which can cause more and more fires. I was making a movie in 2017 in British Columbia. They had an electrical storm that moved across the province, dotting it with lightning. Uh, it started 160 wildfires in one night, totally overwhelmed the capacity of emergency services to deal with the fires. And they had to make decisions like, we can save this mountain. I don't know if we can save this one. Can we save this town? Real ethical considerations come in. Um, I'm, I live in a small uh, farming community, so I'm a volunteer fireman there. I will tell you in consideration of the size of these uh, natural disasters, natural disasters, um, we're not prepared. We're not trained for things as big as some of the events we're seeing, and it makes the job of being a first responder extremely uh, challenging. Right now in Poland, they're fighting the worst wildfire they've had in that country for over a hundred years, although we're not hearing about it. In New York, we will see more and more wildfires because the southern pine beetle has moved uh, north out of its historic range as temperatures have warmed here. Here's something else that has. This is the principal mosquito carrying the Zika virus now in the southern tip of New York. Here's a, uh, an advertisement from Newark Airport about being careful. It, it's interesting too, the way that insect is being affected. The warmer weather allows for more population cycles every year, so uh, for more reproductive cycles every year. So the population is increasing as the, warm, the temperatures warm up, their metabolism speeds up. So they're feeding more often. Uh, there's a bunch of other things, but this by the way is not dissimilar to what we're seeing with deer ticks here and uh, our friends in Illinois are also seeing there. Populations of marine vertebrates have declined 49% on average from 1970 through 2012. We're now at risk of losing up to 50% of all land-based species by the end of this century. Antarctica is losing six times as much ice as it was just 40 years ago. In February, uh, we got almost up to 70 degrees in Antarctica. All of the water from the melting of Antarctica and Greenland and the glaciers has to go somewhere. This is uh, the top 10 cities at risk from sea level rise uh, by 2070, looked at by asset. So Miami, Guangzhou, and then New York. Newark is number three. Sea level in New York Harbor is already 15 inches higher than it was in 1900. And as you may know, we have $129 billion worth of New York real estate, which is already in flood zones. So these are two friends of mine uh, who live in Wilmington, North Carolina. He's a vice cop who did ride-alongs with me, training me for a movie. Uh, when Hurricane Florence hit North Carolina, their house was submerged under 40 feet of water. It went over their house. They escaped, uh, were unhurt, 
returned a week or so later and the house was a total teardown, not only because of the water, but because a sewage treatment plant had overrun. So their home was full of human fecal matter. We have to recognize these uh, weather disasters are occurring not in pristine environments. There are all kinds of toxics and things released. Now, we'll hear a bunch about folks like that, stories like that. What we don't hear about again is while Hurricane Florence was going on, there were at least seven other major cyclonic events happening all over the world. This is a photograph from Typhoon Mancoot that hit the Philippines. I was with uh, the head of, um, of, oh, language, don't leave me. Uh, anyhow, I was with a, a dignitary from uh, the Philippines, uh, the, the head of human rights for the Philippines. Um, at the Bar Association a week or so after this. And he told me that luckily there was not a lot of loss of human life. However, what there was, was thousands of farmers uh, lost their farms. And uh, they do not have the economic wherewithal to prop those farmers back up. So those folks are homeless. Those farms are not producing for the economy. We have to recognize that we are affecting thousands and thousands of people around the world right now by our inactions. This is Taklaban City in 2013, 1.1 million people displaced by uh, Typhoon uh, Haiyan when it hit there. The Pope visited right after that and wrote this extraordinary encyclical in which he wrote, the gravest effects of all the attacks on the environment are suffered by the poorest. And he's absolutely right about that. The truth of the matter is the poor people, the people who have uh, profited the very least off the burning of fossil fuels, suffer the great indignities, partly because uh, they have less robust early warning systems. They may have less robust emergency services. Many, many of the cities are coastal, where a lot of uh, the weather disasters are happening. Should also mention, there are a lot of studies that show spikes in violence against uh, marginalized people, Minorities, uh, women, LGBTQ folks, and minorities, of course, uh, is defined differently depending on populations in different places. Uh, but there are big spikes in violence in the wake of these natural disasters. So you may have heard the ICPP, the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate, IPCC, Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, put a huge report out uh, in which they said the climate change requires rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented action. What they said was, if we don't stop climate change at two degrees Celsius by 2030, we are condemned to it going to three degrees by 2040. Now that doesn't sound like anything. That's one degree, what does that matter? I'll tell you one, just one thing that that means. Um, uh, three degrees means 99% of the coral reefs in the world will die. Coral reefs provide storm barriers to coastal cities. Coral reefs uh, also are breeding grounds for an enormous amount of the protein that feeds the world. That's one example out of many. So if the new IPCC report isn't a call to action, what is? Ben Stevenson, the great environmentalist from Vermont, has written, those who will have the blood on their hands, those who will be judged most culpable by our children and by future generations are not only the denialists, and obstructionists, but the moderates, the cautious pragmatists, the reasonable, serious, centrist voices who fail to acknowledge the true scale, urgency, and gravity of the climate catastrophe, and so fail to address it in any meaningful way. It has long been the case that it was simply enough just to say, I believe climate change is real. That's not the case anymore. We have to act. The time for just believing is long past. We all have to take action because as Dr. King reminds us, we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. Usually, when I give this speech <laughs> to an audience of, of people, uh, I ask at this point how everybody's feeling, if anybody's depressed or upset or feeling overwhelmed. And normally what happens is, um, uh, nobody does anything, and then eventually maybe one person will raise their hand, and then a whole bunch of people raise their hands. One of the reasons I think people don't act on the climate crisis is they're afraid they're gonna get depressed. Um, if you're feeling any of those things, what I normally say in a room full of people raising their hands is look around you. 
you're right in the middle of the herd. You're not crazy. You would be crazy if you weren't feeling some of those things. So I just want to say, if you're feeling any of those things, good. Congratulations. You have good mental health. Um, it, it's right. But there's a way out of all of that. I want to talk about that. So must we change normally with an audience? People say yes at this point. Can we change? Well, the great news is that we have a lot of the solutions that we need, and we've had a lot of them for a long time. This is the world's very first solar array. It was installed in New York City in 1884 by Charles Fritz. These are projections about how well uh, wind energy would do. In 2000, worldwide wind energy capacity was uh, projected to reach 30 gigawatts by 2010. By 2019, that goal was exceeded by a factor of 22 times. This is world energy capacity from 1980 through now, kind of flying up through the roof as the uh, cost curve goes down and down and down. There are places in Texas where they give away electricity free at night because there's so much wind energy. This is solar where the projections are even better. In 2002, they thought the energy market would grow one gigawatt per year by 2010. 2010, it had gone seven. 17 times higher than that. In 2019, it was 101, uh, 121 times higher than the original projection. And this is world solar photovoltaic, uh, photovoltaic installations. It's hard trying to go quick. Uh, flying up through the roof. As the cost of crystalline silicon solar cells goes down and down and down, about 10% per year projected right now to continue that down curve through about 2028. So this is now what we're seeing, which is uh, photovoltaics on grass huts in the Sudan. I love this picture. This is um, in Japan. Uh, they're using old golf courses uh, to put up solar arrays. Uh, anything that gets rid of golf courses is fine by me. So this is the Chilean solar market. At the end of uh, 2013, they had 11 megawatts installed. I show you this to show how fast this is ramping up. So this is what's installed, uh, has been approved, or is being installed right now. From 11 megawatts in 2013, we're up at 16.67 gigawatts. Now I could show you similar charts for Morocco, for a, a lot of places around the world. You may be aware in 2015, the Paris Climate Accord got signed by virtually every nation on earth. Uh, Syria and Nicaragua did not sign the agreement. Uh, the current president has said that we're, we're out. Um, he, he doesn't seem to know that we're not out. Uh, we actually can't get out until the day after the next presidential election. Contractually, we are still in the Paris Climate Accord. And the other truth is, uh, were he to change his mind or were someone else to get elected and want to get in, uh, they could just sign a piece of paper and in 30 days we would be right back in the accord. I want to talk briefly about Greta Thunberg. This is totally uh, not right of me to do, but I want to mention that she's the daughter of an actor and an opera singer. You may remember in 2018, every year there's a thing called the COP, which is a convention of parties that the IPCC has. They gather everybody together to try and figure out what they can improve on, what's gone right, what's gone wrong, where are, they, where are their blind spots. The current administration sent someone who said to the gathered leaders from around the world, what you have to do is burn more coal. That's the way out of the climate crisis. And there were about five people who stood up and resurrected uh, the COP, one of which was Greta, then 16, who said, since our leaders are behaving like children, we will have to take the responsibility they should have taken so long ago. And what you probably didn't hear about was that COP was a big success, so successful that the guy running it was dancing on a table at the end of it, because they did big things. They figured out, for example, uh, how to quantify if a nation said, we're cutting our greenhouse gas emissions by X amount, they figured out ways to find out whether or not that was actually true. But a lot of times we don't hear the good news. Here's a little good news you may not have heard. On April 15th, a judge revoked the permit for the Keystone XL uh, pipeline, delaying construction of that, which I think is great news. Here's a little more great news. These are U.S. coal plants from 2005 to 2017 that were proposed and defeated. These were ones, uh, existing plants that were retired, and these are the ones where their retirement has been announced. All of them have been closed. This is mostly because of economics. The truth of the matter is renewables are just cheaper. 
how do we know that's true? One of the way we know that that's true is the, the Kentucky Coal Mining Museum has installed solar panels on its roof. They expect to save between eight and $10,000 a year on their electricity. This is global electric cars on the road, uh, the, going up and up and up again. Now, a lot of times you'll hear people say, well, the only reason that renewables do so well is because of the subsidies. So I think this is 2015, 2016, the US spent $27 billion on renewable subsidies. At the same time, we spent $699 billion on fossil fuel subsidies. The reason why renewables are winning is they are cheaper. They just are. There, there's no way to compare how much they're being propped up by the, the fossil fuels are being propped up by the United States and globally. Solar is also uh, a great uh, job engine. Uh, solar installer is forecast to be the number one fastest growing job category in the US through 2026. Wind turbine service technician is number two, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. I'm sorry this is so New York centric. But New York uh, last year passed this extraordinary uh, uh, thing, the CLCPA, the Community Leadership and Climate Protection Act. Uh, it says we have to get 70% of our electricity from renewable sources by 2030, 100% by 2040. It's uh, something to be deeply, deeply proud of. Uh, ethical communities and religious communities are, are both leaping on board with this. The Vatican has said they're going to be the first nation state to be run fully on renewables. They're a very small state, but I'll take it. Uh, all of these religious organizations from across the religious spectrum are, are working on this issue. And then, of course, we have the incredible youth uh, climate strike. So I don't know how it is for everybody else. I'm 58. The thing to me that they do most profoundly is they prick my consciousness. The idea that I am giving a um, uh, degraded, possibly unlivable world to younger people coming after me is so horribly morally repugnant. I feel very good about the work they're doing. So the question is, will we change? I think we definitely will change. We're seeing great popularity for this thing. This was the March on the UN several years ago. We saw the March for Science, the Women's March, had a, a big climate contingency. Uh, of course, the Youth Climate Strike, uh, the Zero Hour March, on and on and on. The question isn't really, will we change? It's, are we gonna change fast enough uh, to avert the very worst effects of the climate crisis? Okay, so what's being done by the artistic community? A ton of stuff. So we know in filmmaking, there've been a bunch of kind of action adventure movies. There've also been some serious dramas that haven't necessarily performed terribly well, but really glad they're out in the world. Uh, then documentaries, there are just tons of documentaries. Uh, on the production side, there are all kinds of things being done too. This is a movie I did called Sweetland. Um, that I love that uh, was the first carbon neutral independent movie ever made. Green Product Placement is doing extraordinary work um, uh, to get um, sustainable products on television shows and in movies. The Producers Guild of America has put out a green production guide. The EMA, the Environmental Media Association, you may see this seal on some TV shows, some movies, saying that they have met uh, sustainable environmental standards in making those shows. In theater, there are a ton of plays dealing with climate change. Then there are organizations like Julie's Bicycle and the Broadway Green Alliance, and of course, the very maligned Chicago Green Theater Alliance that are doing great work in trying to make uh, theater in those communities sustainable as well. The Climate Reality Project has a thing called the 100% Committed Campaign. And what we do is we seek to get partners who are um, colleges, universities, um, uh, municipalities, 
businesses to commit to switching to 100% renewable electricity by 2030. Um, and I just want to tell you briefly, because this year I've started really focusing on the film, television, theater communities. So the Minneapolis Playwright Center has joined on this year, the Hudson Valley Film Commission, the Story Horse Documentary Theater, Troop Vertigo, our first renewable circus, uh, and their theater school, uh, Cirque School LA has joined in as well, the new Native Theater. Uh, Empire FX, which is the biggest uh, special effects house in New York State. Uh, last month, BCDF Pictures signed on for their studio. And today, uh, this morning, Upriver Studios also signed on. So in music, there's all kinds of things going on too. There's a lot of sampling that's going on with speeches of Greta Thunberg set to house music and stuff. In the classical community, they do this weird thing where they take that healing curve that we looked at, which is those CO2 emissions going up and up and up, and overlay that onto musical bars, and they play the healing curve. <clears throat> and it's really annoying. <laughs> it goes, -na 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 it goes up and up and up and up. Uh, the dance community has been doing a huge amount of stuff. The choreographer KT Nelson said, we have the science and the numbers. What we're missing and what dance can deliver is the emotion. And I think that's true across the artistic community. What we can deliver is another level to how this story uh, gets told. The visual arts community has been extraordinarily robust in dealing with this. Tim, we're at about five minutes. Should do me. This is Banksy's uh, latest thing in London uh, for uh, the Extinction Rebellion movement. So what can you do? Um, the, the real question is, what can't you do? Because basically everything affects um, climate change. Everything, all of our decisions in our life affect them. So earlier when I was saying I don't tend to get depressed around this, it's because I'm active. If you listen to this, if you watch documentaries about this and you don't get active, it's like being told you have cancer and then deciding you're not gonna to go to a doctor and deal with it, of course you're gonna get depressed. If you get active, uh, you're not going to. And we know, you guys know all of these ways to move forward. Uh, there, there's also a book, Drawdown, which uh, gives a hundred different uh, solutions uh, to consider. There are all kinds of solutions. Please get involved, please get active. Um, I will, for the New Yorkers, throw up in the chat box uh, some legislation to consider. Uh, like it, don't like it, but look into it uh, to help the state get where we need to go. But I wanna talk about the real reason I started the Climate Actors. I'm, I'm just about done. Um, so I give these speeches. One of my big concerns is that, that environmentalists tend to talk inside the environmental bubble. So I don't. I've gone out of my way to talk to oppositional groups and uh, denialist groups. I'm trying to talk to the New York State militia right now because I believe in that. Now, what tends to happen when people talk about this stuff is they come, when you hear a scientist, he'll come from his place of expertise uh, and you hear expertise. Uh, you hear people coming from the places where they're powerful. What actors can do is come from our sadness and our shame and all of those places. And it's really important that we don't just come out of our pride because it lets you be a human being and it lets audiences recognize uh, that you're like them. So for example, when I talk in maximum security prisons, I start by talking about the fact that I was a drug addict and an alcoholic and I, I robbed people years ago. Um, it's been 33 years since I've done any of those things. But I, I want to start as a human being. 
I want to cross those lines. So that's the big thing as storytellers that we can do is reach out as human beings and cross that line. Maybe the biggest thing that you can do is disabuse yourself of the lie that your actions don't matter. They do. You are irreplaceable in this struggle. Um, I'll put this up. If anybody wants to, I would love for you to join the climate actors. Um, lastly, really quickly, I want to just throw out six or seven reasons why we have to deal this now while we're in the middle of the coronavirus thing. <clears throat> Number one, there are two uh, crises happening simultaneously. One of them does not ameliorate the other one. And uh, because global warming gases we put up stay there for a long time, the effect is cumulative. So we have to deal with this now. We need to, as we need to flatten the coronavirus curve, we also have to flatten that carbon curve. Number two, there's probably never been a clearer example of what happens when we willfully ignore science than what we're seeing with the coronavirus. It's exactly what we're seeing with the climate crisis. We need science education in school. We need climate literacy in school, and we should be calling out for those things. Number three, there's a whole issue of environmental racism, which is the siting of toxic polluting plants in poor communities and communities of color. They have terrible health problems as a result. So during the coronavirus, for example, people in those communities who may suffer from respiratory illnesses, asthma, uh, heart conditions, are at much greater risk. Also, the current administration hasn't slowed down at all during this crisis. They've actually used it as a reason, uh, for example, for the EPA not to regulate uh, anymore. Um, so if they're not going to slow down, we can't slow down. Um, the move to renewables uh, is a job builder, uh, can, is cheaper, and I think it can, should be an essential part to rebuilding the economy in the post-COVID world. And lastly, we have the great inspiration of seeing what's happening in the natural world right now of seeing bluer and bluer skies. Uh, and I think it should inspire us. Thank you for listening to me talk so quickly. I hope I made it in 45 minutes. Yes, you did. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, I'm certainly feeling inspired and I would love uh, to open the floor to question. I'm gonna move to the chat now. Uh, there were some wonderful resources and, um, and some great discussion that happened in the chat. I believe a question or two was posed and answered as you went by some of the other wonderful experts here. Uh, so if I missed one, uh, I apologize. But I think the last question I see that wasn't answered is just uh, for some information from Kristen, that you went through the list of studios and companies that pledged to the 100% greener pledge. Is there a list of those studios or companies that exist somewhere? No, um, not that I know of. If, um, well, yeah, there, there is, but it's a little outdated. If you go to Climate Reality 100% Committed Campaign on, on Google, on your interweb, um, it, there, there is a list of um, logos and stuff put up there. They aren't, uh, it hasn't been updated recently. So a bunch of those are all recent kind of partners and haven't been put up there. Um, I could get you the list of those guys if you can uh, get me an email or a phone number or um, something like that through our friends at Broadway Cares or Broadway Green Alliance. It's hard talking so fast. I'm a mess right now. <laughs> it's, we are all friends, so I love that. Great. Well, I can absolutely, I'll make that connection. Or if, you, if we get that list, I bet everyone might be interested in it and we can share it in our post uh, wrap up email. So we'll do that. Are there other questions from the group? I think we're small enough we can ask questions by voice. Absolutely. Once and I'm just going to post yep. for our New York friends. Um, this is a list of. Oh, no, it's not. That didn't work. Um, in a second, I will post a, a list of um, state, New York State environmental legislation that uh, I'm not going to do it. It's not letting me. Never mind. That's fine. Tim, that's another thing. If you want to send it to me, we can send out. We're going to have a very robust uh, post uh, email. There is a lot of resources to include. So this will be a hearty email full of resources for everyone. 
So what are your favorite policy solutions for decarbonizing by 2050, regulation, subsidies, carbon pricing? Um, I think anything that gets us there. I mean, the truth is, I, I think uh, smarter environmentalists than me have said there's no silver bullet. There's like silver buckshot. So um, I'm really interested in, you know, there's a, um, a New York State uh, piece of legislation to outlaw a um, coal-based ceiling, uh, ceiling um, element that does seals cracks in parking lots. There's one that's not fossil fuel based. That's such a tiny thing. But I think to the degree we attend to every detail, we're going to get where we need to go. And education, that's the thing, you know, um, talking to people, um, including and maybe even especially your uncle at Thanksgiving who thinks this is not true. It's really vital. It's really, 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 really vital. Is climate reality continuing leadership training virtually? Um, we haven't been yet. I know they're really thinking about it. Um, you can also become a member of climate reality. Um, there are chapters. You don't have to be a trained leader to be in a chapter. Um, and it's a good avenue. You know, one of the great things you can do, like joining the Broadway Green Alliance, the Chicago Theater Alliance, um, the Chicago Green Theater Alliance, um, join environmental groups. Consider joining, you know, the NRDC or 350 or Sierra Club, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, or local small ones in your community. Uh, is climate reality continuing leadership training virtual? Oh, I did that one. Um, it just bumped up. Oh, that's great. Yeah, Jennifer adds, yeah, you're a leader already and the experience was amazing. That's great. I, I was hoping to do the leadership training, but. You will. I will. On there the other side time. of the coronavirus. Yep. If not great. before. Um, earlier in the chat, I know that there was a question that was answered, but I'm curious as to your thoughts, Tim, about news sources you recommend for the type of news that you look for, for environmental news and things like that. Yeah, it's, it's actually really interesting. The, um, the, uh, main, the, the main news people for an awful long time didn't cover the climate movement. I now feel like it's almost... I should say this as pre-corona. I'm not quite sure it's as true now. But, you know, we got to the point this year where it was impossible to open the New York Times without a story about the climate crisis. I feel like the mainstream media really has picked up on this. Um, there, there are some great uh, climate change podcasts. The Hip Hop Caucus does a great podcast. Um, there's a podcast, oh, I have to look on my phone. Um, there's uh, um, my favorite one is the Climate One podcast out of the Commonwealth Institute in San Francisco. Um, does amazing stuff. I, I would also say if you are having um, a conversation with somebody and they bring up nihilist points about all of this, um, skepticalscience.com is uh, an incredible wealth of how to answer uh, climate skeptics um, there. Uh, Inside Climate is very good as a news source, says someone. Um, do you believe, uh, do you have thoughts on movements like Extinction Rebellion versus Sunrise Movement, etc.? I think that the, we live in a wonderful big ecosystem of environmental groups and movements, and I think they all, um, they, they all benefit each other. And, and frankly, the fact that there are um, stodgy legislative wonks and people having sit-ins, and it needs all of it. Um, and all of it seems to me to be how we move the ball forward. I get very worried about, um, we live in a society where people express outrage on social media, and in my opinion, are feeding cortisol addictions, addictions to outrage in doing that. And I don't in any way believe that fundamentally moves the ball forward. I think Twitter is a good platform for talking to people who are already converted 
but I don't think you ever convert anybody on Twitter. Um, and I just think real, pol real change takes more work than that. Um, do I have thoughts on your inside? What are your thoughts on the fact that so many big acting opportunities are in cities that are at high risk because of climate crisis? Do you think the industry is going to have to change um, location due to all this? I think, um, I think the industry, it's so funny. I was just writing this morning about the first movie I ever did. The, um, the DP of that movie shot the movie, The African Queen. Um, they used as special effects a thing they used to do called plate shots where they took a plate of glass and they would paint sets onto that and shoot through it and have actors stand behind it. It's the most fantastic special effects that I don't think anybody would have the craftsmanship to pull off anymore. But uh, it's, I think it's always changed. So we're gonna have to adapt. Every industry is gonna have to adapt. Uh, Green Tech Media has an app for news about renewable industries. Resources for the Future is an organization with a website that is on the cutting edge for global decarbonization strategies. Look at you smart people. I should have just been quiet and let you guys talk. Um, see what else did I cover those I think I did anyone else do we have a final question in the group somebody want to unmute throw another question in the chat no great that was so thorough I think everyone is absorbing still I know I am yes thank you all right well then we will wrap up here thank you so much everyone for joining us thank you Tim uh, for such an unbelievable talk. Uh, Thank we, you. Everyone was, <laughs> I will speak for myself. I just absolutely love listening to you speak. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge, for inspiring us to keep up this fight, even when we are again in dual crises um, and, you know, and need that inspiration and need this knowledge. And thank you again. For thank those you. of you who've joined us, uh, we uh, will be continuing these every Thursday. Uh, with our wide variety of topics. Next week, we will be moving uh, into a slightly different territory, talking about our lived workspaces and how to make those more sustainable. So bring it back home. Uh, Mara is here and she'll be joining us uh, the following week to teach us about green home gardening. Uh, so you can join us then. And then at the end of the month, we will be doing Compost 101 with uh, a king of compost here in my home city of Philadelphia. Um, we'll be sending out again a thank you email following up with all of the information here from Tim, from the chat, from all of you, so that collective pooled knowledge. We will also be including a survey, which we would absolutely love if you take. It's five questions, and we, in that survey, we'll be asking you if there are any specific topics you would like to see covered. We've been filling these topics a lot with your feedback, so please fill that out and let us know what you want to learn about. So again, a big thank you, Tim, for lending your time and your expertise. And thank you to all of you for joining us again. Take care. Thank you. And join climateactors.org. Yes, you have a thank you. Please join Climate Actors. It's wonderful. Thank, thank you. you.